what is a way of knowing? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> we, we've used this, top, this term a lot. Um, and, but there are some characteristics to it that I think are helpful. One way to think about this is the difference between knowledge and knowing. Right? Now we often think about knowledge. We say knowledge is something that we have individually in our brain. Right? We have, I have knowledge, you have knowledge, been studying here at VIMS, we have all kinds of policy and scientific knowledge that's, that's with you. And that it's captured in procedures, documents, and data banks within an organization. Right? So your scientific discipline has knowledge that you can read about in textbooks, you can find online, you can see in a variety of literatures. Right? And that also knowledge is an outcome. It's a result that people and organizations have. Right? So, so knowledge is something that we have. It's a result. I studied, therefore I have knowledge. Right? So it's kind of a consequence of other procedures. And we think about it like a noun. Right? We think about it as this thing, this entity. There's knowledge out there right? that we can get. Um, then we have it. Right? Another way to think about this, though, is using the term knowing. If I say, how are you knowing this problem? Right? I'm asking, I'm thinking about what I know as collective, meaning that I come to what I know based upon my conversations with others, my experiences with others, my interaction with others. I think of it as emergent. It's changing all the time. It's developing all the time. I think about it as pragmatic. It's based on my practice, right? So I'm a political scientist. I went to school and got my PhD in political science. But I, I practice it. What makes me a political scientist is my continuous practice of it, my engagement with it. Um, it's situated, meaning that how we know is really dependent on the context, the area where we're learning, the area we're engaging. And it's historical. What happened in the past matters for how we know today as well. So that's very different from the kind of cognitive noun, knowledge, <laughs> as an object out there. It's emergent, it's contextual, right? So our day-to-day -day experience, such as implementing and proposing programs, um, are how we know things. What these participants know is inseparable for how they know, right? So how you know your science, how you know public policy, is inseparable from the practice of it, from the even if it's reading, going to this lecture, um, talking with your colleagues, all right? So there's a practice orientation to how we know. It's not just, you know, I read it, it's locked in my brain, now I have it. Um, it's really based upon our daily activities. Ongoing processes that result in different ways of knowing. So it's more procedural, ongoing, emergent. So a way of knowing, the way I know the Chesapeake Bay problem, for example, if I'm, a, if I, if I'm someone who um, harvests cram, uh, clams, for example, okay? That's based upon my daily interaction um, with the cage, I don't know all the language, so sorry you guys, uh, you know, but my daily interaction with the, the cages or the containers that have them and the buying and the selling, and it's emergent. As the conditions change, my knowing of the problems or the issues surrounding that changes as well, right? So it's very active, it's very ongoing. So, oh, I don't wanna go that slide yet. So a way of knowing is, a way that we um, engage a problem or a topic, a way we know it through our practice, right? So we all have ways of knowing problems that may be technical, that may be um, practical, that may be political, but it's, it's through our ongoing practice that we know things, all right? So I'm arguing that by, as leaders, understanding that people have ways of knowing uh, as opposed to preferences, that's important to know. That means that people can come to know things differently. Right? That means through experience, through networking, through different kinds of information, people can come to know things differently. And as a leader, if you can figure out how to bring people together in ways that they can know things differently, um, you, could, you, know, you can maybe address and engage some of these problems on a regular basis. So thinking about it in a more fluid context may be helpful. Now, in that sense, facilitating and not directing. As, as a leader, the work remains with the participants. Work remains with the people who are engaged in these problems at the technical, at the political, and at the uh, local level. Um, effective ways of engaging complex problems require participation from all these domains. Um, there's oftentimes no clear definition of the problem. <laughs> there's no clear solution. So your job as a leader is to try to encourage adaptive work. Ron Heifetz, who's a scholar at um, Harvard at the Kennedy School, has coined this phrase, adaptive work with leadership. And basically, it requires you to, as a leader, to figure out what people need to engage, 
um, to respect each other, to hear each other, to share information with each other, what kind of tools do they need. So you're really thinking about ways to get people to share information so they can come to different ways of knowing public policy problems, right? Um, Ron Heifetz gives this great example in his work about a physician who um, sees a patient for a common cold. The patient comes in and you say, you have a cold, take this medicine, all right? So the problem is clear, the solution is clear, right? Then another patient comes in and their illness is clear, but how to treat it is not clear. They've got high blood pressure, right? So you can take some medication, you can change your diet and exercise, you can reduce your stress levels at work, you might want to change your job, right? So the, so the solution is, is more complicated, right? The, the, diagnosis, the problem is clear, but the solution is more complicated. Then there's a patient who comes in and it's not clear what their illness is. You know, they're suffering all different kinds of symptoms, but their illness is not clear. And then hence the solution is not clear. And so the doctor's job is to work with the patient to try to figure out what the illness is and then to come up with a solution that can help them address it, right? But it's a very collaborative enterprise. The leader, the doctor is facilitating. The patient has a lot of work to do too. The patient's gonna to have to keep track of things, gonna to have to share information with the doctor, is gonna to have to eventually come up with a regime that they can use to, um, to treat the disease as well, and they'll have to follow that. So it's a very collaborative kind of enterprise. Public policy problems are the same way. Rarely do we have a clear sense of what the problem is. You know? What is the problem of the Chesapeake Bay? Yeah. What, what, is, what is the primary problem? Yeah, there's lots of issues associated with that. Yeah, what is the problem with the financial regulatory crisis? There's lots of problems. There's lots of ways we can explain it. And then hence, what is the solution? So to come in you know, with your guns blazing as a leader and say, I know the solution, you know, I know the problem, I know the solution, Probably not, you probably don't. You have one way of knowing things from your perspective. But leadership in these collaborative settings requires really trying to understand the alternative ways of knowing and then finding a way to facilitate the kind of learning process and moving towards a new way of knowing. All right, so let's think here now a little bit about informational and relational work. What kinds of work is the leader doing? Um, what do they focus on? We've thought about this in terms of the information that they share and the relational work that they do. So informational work, leaders gather information, they share and translate information, and they synthesize and advance information. So um, in some instances, it's just a matter of pulling information together that people can use. In other instances, it may be sharing what you've gathered and offering an explanation. You know, um, Troy was telling me about one of the communication experts who shares scientific data with the broader community and translates it. You know, here's some very technical information, Here's, here it is in a format that the business community can relate to. Here it is in a format that the regulatory community can relate to. Right? So there's some translation that goes on that's important there as well. And then there's the synthesizing and advancing. Right? So not only translating, but pulling it together, suggesting alternatives, different ways that people might think about this, right? really advancing it in that sense. Um, and that informational work is, is crucial. I think if you think about a lot of the things that leaders do, a lot of it is informational work. It's really connecting people and connecting ideas and things. There's also then relational work, which is creating connections between people. And this is really important, creating opportunities for empathy, where people can understand alternative ways of knowing. You know, Martha tells this story about um, in, in California, there was an effort to do some development that involved environmental concerns, developer concerns, private property owners. And the planner who was in charge of it was really in a you know, like between 5,000 rocks and a hard place, right? It was really tough to do. And so one of the things that she did was she put everyone on a bus, and they went for a tour all around the city to see all the great things about the city and to talk about what would happen if we did this, what would happen if we did that. And when the ride started, everyone on opposing sides would not sit by each other, right? They didn't, they didn't want to sit by each other. And this one guy didn't want to sit by her, and she interpreted that as because he didn't want to change his way of knowing. He didn't want to be convinced of this, you know? But when you, are, when you understand the way someone else sees a problem, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to say, that's great, I'm convinced. But empathy is so crucial, I think, in being able to share information in a way that can take us to new ways of knowing. And I really do think that this kind of practice-based way of thinking about knowing is a very effective leadership way of understanding the possibilities for transforming how we think about um, these, these problems. So the opportunities for empathy, creating the sense of belonging and legitimacy, um, this is 
you know, I don't know if, you, if you've ever gone to a public hearing before for something, you know, maybe city hall or, you know, school board meeting, and as a member of the public, you're then kind of sitting down <laughs> like that, they say, all right, you come to the microphone and you have three minutes to speak, and then when you're done, you know, it's like, okay, well, um, you know, uh, my trash hasn't been picked up for a while, and you say, okay, all right, your time's up, you know. You don't feel very legitimate in that context, you know, there's kind of a, your, your perspective is treated trivially. Um, you have your five minutes, then you're done, right? Uh, so creating opportunities for people to share their experience that ensures legitimacy and credibility of their experience is really important. There was this um, project in East St. Louis called the East St. Louis Action Research Project between the University of Illinois and the city of East St. Louis. And this one amazing guy named Ken Reard wanted to go to the city and really help the neighborhoods plan their way out of the, the devastation that they face. I mean, poverty, unemployment rate of 33% at the time, no trash collection in the city, uh, drug problems, I mean, it was, it was devastating. The city was really in crisis. And so he would go neighborhood by neighborhood and plan with people. And it took a long time for people to be convinced that he was serious about it. But one of the things that he had to do was find ways to help people in East St. Louis understand that their experiences were not only legitimate, but they were essential to any kind of solution. And so this one experiment that they did when they first started planning, they went to all the residents and they said, we need you to gather data for the planning process. And the residents were like, what do you mean gather data for the planning process? You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a researcher, what are you talking about? They said, no, take this disposable camera and go around your neighborhood and take nine pictures of things that you think are great about your neighborhood and take nine pictures about things that you think are promising about your neighborhood and take nine things that, that pictures of, of what things that you think are terrible about your neighborhood and bring the cameras back and we'll develop the film. So you got all these residents running around with these little yellow cameras taking pictures of their neighbor's garbage cans and their neighbor's cat and you know the abandoned car and the neighbors are saying, hey, what you know, why are you taking pictures of my garbage can? They said, you gotta believe your own camera. You know, you gotta do this too. And so they, pretty soon you had all, all these residents taking pictures of their neighborhood, right? They bring all the data back to the organization. And they develop the film and they do a SWAT exercise. You guys know what a SWAT is? You know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's a kind of analysis that you use to try to identify, you know, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, and how you move forward. It's a strategic planning exercise. In order to do that, though, they use the pictures. So they're doing this SWOT exercise conducted by you know, a consultant, and they've got all the pictures that the residents have collected, and they're using these to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that was so cool, because the residents, they collected the data. Their data was the centerpiece for that strategic planning process. So finding ways to, you know, to make people participating in the process from all these different perspectives feel legitimate and credible, um, and not just feel it, but really, you know, it is a credible exercise, is really important, I think. And then boundary work, working at the boundaries, being, being sure that you are able to, um, uh, you know, find, again, this kind of work where the cameras, you can think of them as boundary objects in a way. They were bringing the residents and the, the kind of experts together in a way that, um, that crossed boundaries. So thinking about ways that you can uh, cross the boundaries to um, improve those experiences.